the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so tonight uh, we're going to dive into morality. Um, uh, and I love, that the I love the way that the Catechism uh, puts this section. Because um, uh, you ask most people, well, what is morality? And what do, they, what do they say? What are some of the answers they'll say? What is morality? Morals, Morals yeah. Ethics. Ethics. Standards. Standards, laws, all those things. You know, so if we were to, you know, subtitle a class on morality, a lot of people would probably subtitle it, you know, especially when you're talking about Catholic morality, uh, all of those laws that you have to follow, you know, all of those obligations. But the way that the Catechism uh, uh, phrases it is they, they call the section on morality life in Christ. And so uh, the kind of the, the, the overall framework I want us to have in our head as we go through uh, morality is not so much here are the laws of the church or even here are the laws of Christ but here is the way that God designed the human person uh, these are the standards to which God created us and when we act according to those standards we become fully alive we become uh, uh, alive in Christ and so uh, an analogy to help us kind of uh, provide an overall framework is um, w when you buy a car you don't just treat the car like you want to treat it what do you do you take care of it according to manufacturers. the manufacturers and what happens if what happens if you don't you void the warranty uh, <laughs> luckily God God's all forgiving and we cannot you know void that warranty with God in any way but the 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 car was created with uh, a, a, a particular way to operate at its optimal. Uh, uh, everything that's created has that specific uh, function, has that specific way to use it correctly. Uh, uh, this is is what you. Is, this is how to use it. Uh, uh, an iPhone makes a great paperweight. <laughs> but at the same time, an iPhone used as a paperweight is a complete waste of you know four or five hundred dollars it's you, you know uh, your, your, your kid would probably look at you and say you should give me that iPhone and I'll give you a rock uh, you know I'll use that the way that it was meant to be used with you know with everything that it can do there's a particular way that it was created and when we when uh, when we use that thing or when we uh, uh, operate that car uh, according to the way that it was built it becomes alive. It becomes uh, working in a proper order that is good for everybody, good for the car. Uh, we don't just decide, well, you know, I'm going to put uh, water in my gas tank, you know. Um, you know, and sometimes it happens by accident. I used, I used to be a mechanic, and we used to get uh, diesel trucks in all the time. And these guys would bring in their diesel trucks, and they're like, I don't know, it won't start. Like, well, what changed? Did, did, did you do anything different? I don't know, I let my wife borrow it and now it doesn't start. <laughs> what does your wife drive? She drives a little car. I'm like, when you gave it to your wife, was it on empty? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sir, so there's probably gasoline in your diesel. You know, And nine times out of ten, that was the case. Uh, um, because, you know, diesels don't run on gas. We can't just put anything we want in there. Um, we have to uh, uh, work with the way that it was designed. The human person is no different. God designed us in his image and his likeness. And so when we talk about morality, don't think of it as, as here's all the rules we have to follow, but here's the manufacturer's standards. You know, here's the way that God created us. And when we, when we cooperate with these laws, it's not to restrict our freedom, but it's to help us 
uh, uh, become fully alive. And so the catechism does a great job of putting it in this way that the, the, the section on morality is life in Christ. And so the catechism says, and I'll put down here always the uh, catechism paragraph, what faith confesses, the sacraments communicate. By the sacraments of rebirth, Christians have become children of God, partakers of the divine nature. Coming to see in the, in the faith their new dignity, Christians are called to lead henceforth a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so right there it kind of brings together uh, the catechism as a whole. So the first part of the catechism was the creed. So what faith confesses, the sacraments communicate. So the sacraments are those, are those events of God's salvific grace. So what faith confesses, the sacraments communicate. And through that, the Christians become partakers of the divine nature. We become uh, uh, partakers of God's grace. When we act with God's grace, uh, uh, we, uh, we become, like they say, uh, we, we lead a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so, since we have become these new creations in Christ, we are called to live differently. To live to a different standard, a higher standard, uh, than, say, uh, what our society holds as kind of a, a norm. And all of us probably know that our society has pretty low standards when it comes to a lot of things. Or no standard at all. That's even the scariest, is that when there is no standard at all. And so, as Christians, we're held to a higher standard. And that's why when we do something wrong, it's even worse. And so things like uh, the, the priest abuse scandal, you know, that's why it's so much worse. Why? Because these men are held to a higher standard. Um, uh, because, you know, even statistically speaking, I think the, the, the rate's even higher, say, in public schools. But we don't hold those school teachers to the standard of a, a Catholic priest. And so when something like that happens, when they're held to that higher standard and they fall, it's that much worse. And so not only is it a, a call of responsibility, um, but it's not a call that we're left alone with. Like we said, through... Uh, the faith we profess and through the sacraments we receive that grace and so we are not left alone we are left uh, with God's grace to cooperate with continuing that paragraph it says they are made capable of doing so by the grace of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit which they receive through the sacraments and through prayer and so those two things in the life of the Catholic play a most important role prayer and the sacraments and so first, what is that, that new beginning, that new creation? Namely, baptism. In baptism, we become not just dead to sin, but we become alive to God in Christ Jesus. Thus, we are called to live a life in conformity to what Christ did and taught. We become one with Christ. And so if you think about, uh, you know, for example, St. Paul and the conversion story of St. Paul, uh, when uh, he's knocked to the ground, Jesus doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the Christians? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? What does he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And just in case uh, uh, Saul didn't hear him, Saul says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so, in a very unique way, Christ has intimately bound himself to the church. And so, when we enter into Christ we also enter into the church. And so when we become uh, alive in Christ in the sacraments, we also become alive in conformity with what Christ did and taught. Catechesis, because most of you will be catechists, catechesis has to reveal in all clarity the joy and the demands of the way of Christ. Catechesis for this newness of life in Him should be uh, the following. Uh, a catechesis of the Holy Spirit, a catechesis on grace, uh, and those two things are intimately bound. The grace, the life of grace, and the life of the Holy Spirit. The Beatitudes, sin, forgiveness, the human virtues, Christian virtues, the twofold commandment of charity, love of God, love of neighbor, and also ecclesiality, the offering of salvation, and the communion of saints. And so, when we talk about morality, don't just think Ten Commandments. 
Now, I know that'll be like the first question you put on a test. Um, but when we talk about morality, it's, it's uh, the Holy Spirit, it's grace, it's the virtues. Um, uh, and especially those virtues, because you know, uh, we need to have correct proportions in the way we present our Catholic faith. That we don't simply say, well, here's all the things not to do. Go and don't do these things. What kind of life is that? You know, uh, and that's the thing. The children will know all the things they can't do, but we also have to help educate them on the things they can do, uh, and most especially the things they can do with the grace of Christ. And so, uh, catechesis must be uh, balanced in that way. Section one. Man's vocation, life in the Spirit. Uh, life in the Holy Spirit fulfills the vocation of every man. The life is made up of divine charity and human solidarity, and it is graciously offered as salvation. And so, when we talk about morality, we do not separate these things from uh, uh, what we confess in the Creed. We do not separate uh, how we act with what we believe. The church has always had that uh, kind of axiom, um, lex credende, uh, lex arande, lex vivende, the law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of life. And so, uh, the other class we were doing, we were looking at uh, uh, the understanding of what we believe about a sacrament, we look for that theology in the prayers. In the same way, what we believe about who Jesus Christ is comes forth in our moral law, comes forth in our morality. And this begins um, first with the dignity of the human person. This is rooted in the creation of man and woman in the image and likeness of God. Uh, Christ, uh, Gaudium et Spes, uh, Paragraph 22, which is one of the documents of Vatican II, it says that Christ makes man fully manifest to himself and brings to light his vocation. So if we as human persons want to know how we, what we were created for, we look to the person of Jesus Christ. And we see what? We see a life of ultimate love, of ultimate sacrifice, which involves suffering. Uh, so as Christians, if we're not suffering in some way, we might be doing something wrong. Um, uh, that, that, but that life of Christ leads to redemption. What the, and we can understand this very clearly, uh, uh, kind of in competition with the world. The world looks at the crucifix and it sees simply a dead man hanging on a cross. But what do we see? We see hope. We see salvation. We see uh, the complete opposite, the complete antithesis of what the world sees when, it, when, we, when they look at the crucifix. And so, uh, for us, when we want to see uh, who we were created to be, we look to Christ himself. And uh, the church is simply saying that Christ has the grace, has the power to make that understanding known to us, in reference to him. Humans are endowed with a spiritual and immortal soul and is thus the only creature that is willed for its own sake. And so uh, uh, because of that, Christ made us his high, his high point of creation. That we do not simply uh, uh, operate within God's creation, but we participate in it. Uh, and we do that through a variety of ways. To be made in the image of, of God uh, involves several different things. First, because people have intellect, will, and the ability to reason, they are given freedom. This is part of the divine image. Part of this is recognizing that it is proper to go do good, avoid evil. Almost everybody in the entire world would agree with that statement. That on a, on a, moral, life, on a moral level, we must do good and avoid evil. Like I said, most everybody. Um, this is in our intellect, it comes forth in our own reasoning, in our actions, and therefore our will. And so, uh, um, this, this part of imaging of God is something that we share uh, with all humans. However, sin disfigured this image, and it, and it is now wounded. This wound divides man within himself and outside himself. And so, 
uh, it's what the church calls, here's a fancy word to impress your family and friends at Thanksgiving, the preternatural gifts. Preternatural gifts. And so what the preternatural gifts were, were those gifts that, that God gave humanity before the fall. After the fall, these gifts were lost. And so those gifts of uh, infused knowledge, the gifts of, of perfect harmony, we had perfect harmony not only with, between Adam and Eve, but be within ourselves and with all of creation. So what's the first thing that happens after creation? What? They hide themselves from each other. They are in discord. Adam sa or God tells Adam that he will now have to toil for his food, so he's put at odds with, uh, uh, with creation. And there's also that blasted thing called concupiscence, that we have that inclination to sin from, he from here on out. That uh, uh, no matter how good we are, no matter how much we cooperate with God's grace, we will still have an incl inclination to sin. That we are stuck with. That is that kind of scar that we have from original sin. Um, but uh, there's hope that Christ came not only to heal the wound, but to transform us so that we may participate in the life of God, which we call grace. And so this is ultimately, this ultimately leads uh, to our highest vocation, which is beatitude or uh, eternal happiness. The beatitudes, the, the eight beatitudes, they call us to something higher than the thou shalt not to the Ten Commandments. And so uh, when, we, when we go through those, we have the, uh, uh, the thou shall not, but then Christ brings the Beatitudes, which he says, blessed you know, are the peacemakers, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God, that he calls them to a higher standard. They shed light on the actions and the attitudes uh, characteristic of the Christian life, the Catechism says in 1717. Any questions so far? If, if there's any questions, just... Raise your hand or throw something at me. You know, sure. Uh, what about those people that they say you know, like have no conscience whatsoever? Is that because of their life of sin that lead them up to that? You know, these these prisoners in, in jail or you know Charles Manson, they they have absolutely no oh, conscience. Who you know those type of people. You know, is is that from from birth? I mean, you know, those yeah, nature, nurture. I mean, something like that. I mean, who knows? And and, and a lot of you know. A lot of that, uh, and that's why, and that's why when we, you know, and we'll we'll get to that when we talk about culpability. Okay. That the church, when we talk about morality, especially we we make judgments about certain acts, but we do not make judgments about people. Okay. But if, but we do we do go on to say that if somebody does this with full knowledge, with full consent, and they know uh, uh, that it is grave in these things then there's a good chance that they have put their, their eternal beatitude in jeopardy. Um, but it's important to know that the church, the church has never said, the church de has declared over 10,000 saints, but the church has never declared that this person is in hell. The church has never said that. Um, uh, we simply entrust them to the mercy of God. Um, but we will say, if somebody does this, this, does this say you know a very serious sin? If they do it with full knowledge, then uh, uh, then that is a mortal sin, and the punishment is death. The punishment is hell. Um, but we but we do not we reserve that judgment of people uh, to God. But acts we can we can place a judgment on those. And so it's not just that God put this you know. Uh, our, our goal, our end game is going to be this eternal happiness. It's not that he just kind of put this out there like, you know, uh, your goal is to write a, a final paper, you know. Why? Because none of us have a desire to write a final paper ever in our life. And that's why that, the whole exercise of doing something like that is so painful uh, um, uh, sometimes. Um, and so God puts that end, but he also puts that desire within us. To have that natural desire, like that car is built to drive, and so the components fit with the way that it was uh, uh, built. In the same way with us, God designed us for Himself. And God alone satisfies 
and he has put this desire in all of our hearts to be happy. Uh, therefore, only God can make us happy, and the Beatitudes reveal the goal of our existence, both personally and as a church. And so there's kind of those two dimensions of uh, the Beatitudes. Um, and so it's important for us to, to, to remember that, that, that we all have that desire to be happy. How we reach and attain that happiness, well, that's a different story, and that's something uh, uh, that, uh, that we'll look at that's very important. So, everything, everything must be prefaced with freedom. Um, now, we cannot even talk about morality unless we have freedom. Um, God created humans with free will, and uh, simply because if we do not have the ability to say no, our yes means nothing. We are simply, you know, that's, that's robots. You know, I, I push the button on my vacuum and it comes on. There it is. And that's essentially what we would be if God did not give us some sort of freedom. And so in order, uh, the catechism in the church has always said, in order to live a basic human life, a person must have freedom. And so that's why the church has been one of the most outspoken on uh, uh, freedom of, of all different kinds. Uh, religious freedom um, and natural human freedom as well. The more one does good, the more one becomes free. Um, and a way that we can understand that, uh, uh, as opposed to freedom, is just do whatever you want. Um, think about it this way, that uh, freedom must always be properly oriented towards doing good. When we, when we act in that way, we become more free. So, for example, if everybody in the world decided to exercise the freedom and to say, we will not uh, uh, do two of the Ten Commandments. We will not steal and we will not murder. How much more free would our entire world be? We could go hiking in the mountains of Afghanistan. We could go, you know, uh, 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 trail riding through the Gaza Strip. Why? Because we understand that everybody, I, I won't steal, Nobody's going to steal from me and nobody's going to murder me. By, by people exercising their freedom towards good, we all become more free. Um, it, it, it's a very simple, but it's a very beautiful concept um, that, the, that freedom must always be attached to that good. That real freedom is not the ability to choose to do evil. Freedom is not just this, you know, I'll do whatever I want. It's uh, aimed at the good. And when it is aimed at the good in that way, it benefits everybody. And so, um, not only does that point to uh, uh, our individual rights as humans, but it also points to the, to the fact that we were made for uh, life in a community. That our actions affect others greatly. That when we choose to exercise our freedom uh, uh, for good, uh, uh, it, it greatly benefits everybody. And the church does make a point to uh, uh, say that religious freedom should be at the center of every society. So, freedom and salvation. Humans freely sin. Sin wounded human nature. Therefore, we need a Savior to restore our broken relationship with God. And so, uh, it's very important for us to, to, to understand that, that that choice was there, they chose to sin, therefore we need a savior. Um, uh, if you throw a, a, a baseball through, uh, through the school window, and I've seen those windows, they're big, they're nice, they're all the protective and they're really nice. So, and the teacher said, okay, the bill will be a thousand dollars. Would you say, okay, can I write you a check? No, why? You don't have $1,000. Uh, we're in that same situation with original sin. And so, like in your case, you would say what? Father, help me. In our case, we do the same thing. Father, help us. That's what the Israelites did the entire Old Testament. Father, help us. Uh, and so, the Father sent His Son to, 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 to step in and, and mediate, to take on 
that broken window to take on that sin and pay the debt. Um, but he didn't just pay the debt and said, now you, now you stupid humans, you can just roam free and not worry about anything. But he said, I'll pay the debt and I will also open heaven. Heaven will now be an option for us. But again, he doesn't force uh, his grace on us. He doesn't force heaven on us. He always gives us that ability uh, uh, to choose. You know, so you know, like the uh, like the saying, you know, uh, hell is locked on the inside, uh, or the gates of hell are locked on the inside. So uh, we need that savior. We need uh, that restoration of what was broken. So the morality of human acts. And so because we understand that, that, uh, that foundation of freedom, things that we do have a particular morality. And so uh, for the church, there's kind of three sources of morality. The object, uh, the end in view, so the intention and the circumstances. Um, and so a, a good way to understand this is the, uh, what it is that I want. So um, I want a Pepsi. The way I'm going to get a Pepsi is I'm going to walk to the store and pay for it. And the circumstances are, it's 7 o'clock, you know, uh, I'm teaching a class, um, and it's, you know, still hot as blazes out there. Um, those are, you know, all the circumstances surrounding it. So we're going to see that uh, all of these three things we have to take into account when we choose to act morally. Do we go through this process every time we make a moral choice? No. A lot of it we do quickly, it's easy, but there are some where we have to sit down and say, okay, is what we are desiring good? Is the means that we are choosing to obtain this good, is, are those means good? And do the circu are, is it the right time? Are the circumstances uh, 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 benefiting the good or are the circumstances drawing away from uh, uh, the act itself? But before we get into that, it's important to talk about culpability. And we must distinguish between the morality of an act and the culpability of a person. Again, we do not judge persons, we judge acts. Culpability is based on more than just uh, the moral act itself. What we're going to look at mostly is the moral act itself. We, 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 we are not looking at uh, the person in that way. So, again, those three things, the object, the means, and the circumstances, when these three things are together, we have that moral act. So just to give you kind of a, a visual image, that we will look at all three of these things with any moral act. So, uh, uh, the first two, the object and the means. So, the intention, I want the Pepsi. The means, I'm going to walk to the store. These must always be good. So, is desiring a Pepsi good? Yeah, if it's my 12th one, well, okay, now we're getting into circumstances. You know, is it all right? Yeah, sure. The object's good. Wanting a Pepsi's good. The means, I'm going to walk to the store uh, uh, and pay for it with my own money. That's also good. Uh, so would we say, oh, the moral act's totally good. So far, so good, but we must also look at the circumstances, including the consequences that we can foresee. These must also be weighed. So right now I have the responsibility of teaching this class. So if I were to simply say, excuse me, I'm going to go walk to the store to get a Pepsi, y'all would probably lose what little respect you have for me already. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Hopefully. But you would lose respect for somebody who is, who is in charge to give a presentation, who is, who's, you know, you guys have given up your hard time to be here, time with your families, driven distances to be here, and here I am just going to stop when I, simply, when I have a bottle of water right here. But you know what, just because I want a Pepsi, I'm going to go get one. So therefore, the whole act would be wrong based on the circumstances. But the object and the means, those are still both good. Circumstances can never make an act good or evil. So when we look at these like the means, because we, we just talked about this, the means. So uh, uh, walking, to get, walking to the store to get a Pepsi, the circumstances do not make that 
evil, but it makes the whole act evil. And so, like, it, like we say there, the circumstances, they can make the entire moral action uh, immoral. So, a lot of times, let me give you an example to clarify this. A lot of times people will say, okay, it's one of those save the world, you know. So, if there was somebody holding a bomb and all I had to do was uh, 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 shoot them and uh, it was an innocent person, all I had to do was shoot them and I would save the world. Is the intention save the world? Well, that's good. Um, the means, I'm going to shoot an innocent person, not good evil. In fact, that's evil. But the circumstances are, well, I'm going to save so many more people than just that one life. If you've ever watched 24 with Jack Bauer, this is where the whole premise of the show is this guy is constantly doing horrible things uh, uh, and justifies it throughout, I think, eight or nine seasons by, well, we're saving the United States. We're saving, it's always, you know, a nuclear explosion or things like that. They're justifying these, these horrible things uh, why? Because of the greater good. Yeah, people, people start getting degrees there. The greater good. No, the object and the means must always be good. The circumstances of, well, we can save more people, we can do this, we can do that. Those, the circumstances can never change the morality of that act. We have to look at that act in and of itself. Does that make sense? It's important that that makes sense, otherwise it might be a little muddy. Uh, uh, moving on. And it still probably will be because it's it is uh, one of those things. So the circumstances they can change, they can make the whole entire action, me going to get a Pepsi, wrong. But it does not change uh, the means. Um, okay. So there can be bad consequences in a moral action um, but they must always lie within the circumstances. So um, for example, the, the Pepsi. Uh, is it really good that I drink that much sugar, you know, say it's my you know, third one of the day, you know, or, I, or I get one of the, you know, the new Root you know, 78 from, uh, from Sonic, you know, 78 ounces. Does anybody really need that much soda? Uh, there's going to be some bad consequences from that. Um, there can be bad consequences, but they must always be in the circumstances, not in the intention or in the means to acquire that intention or the end. Okay? I know it's late and everybody's uh, been at work and at home and all that. So, now, there are things that the church says, uh, there are things that are objectively evil or intrinsically immoral. Do we use those terms synonymously? There are things that are always wrong. They can never be justified. Um, we can never choose them. And we give a couple of examples there. Uh, you know, murder is also another one, obviously. Uh, the killing of an innocent person. Always wrong. Uh, the passions. Passions are emotions or feelings of the sensitive appetite that incline us to act or not act in regard to something felt to be good or bad. Passions themselves are neither evil uh, or good. And it's important for us to understand that. They're neither evil nor good. However, they must be controlled. The passions must be controlled. They incline us one way or the other, but they themselves are not evil or bad. So that's why when we talk about morality, we always talk about forming our conscience or moral formation. Why? Because if we, are, if we are left to our own devices, you know, like, uh, uh, and we're not, you know, formed, you know, my, my uh, you know, six-year-old, he gets mad, he hits somebody, you know, he gets mad at me, he, you know, why? He's just acting straight out of his passions. It's my duty as a parent to help form him, to help say, okay, do not let your passions control you. But, because you are made in the image of likeness, this is not the speech I give him, but by the way. <laughs> because you are made in the image of likeness of God, you have an intellect, you have a will, 
uh, and you need to exercise those. You have the ability to reason. You need to start. Ex you know, that's the that's the reality of it. But you know, obviously, that's not the, it's not what I tell him. Um, but that's essentially what we go through because we're wounded by sin. Uh, we need that formation. We need kind of that exercise of uh, mastering ourselves, mastering our passions. Gaudium et Spes, another document of Vatican II, uh, states that conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in the depths. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful description. Um, and our conscience is, has the ability to judge what is right and what is wrong. And I love uh, uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman. Um, he gave the image of, because uh, conscience is one of those things where people say, well, I just follow my conscience, you know, so, you know, I kicked a puppy. You know, they're, they're, people follow their consciences to do horrible things. And so, uh, uh, Cardinal Newman says, uh, conscience is like a, a, a crystal clear lake. Uh, uh, on a beautiful day, it perfectly ref reflects that which is above. The same with us, you know. When our conscience is rightly formed, it perfectly resembles, it perfectly reflects that which is above. But how easy a little pebble thrown into the lake muddies everything up, distorts the image. Uh, uh, and in that way it ceases to reflect that which is above. Uh, he says it's the same with our life, that uh, uh, our conscience when it's properly formed is clear, but how easy when the passions are set off, when those emotions take over, that we simply throw all reason aside, put our intellect in our back pocket, and we act, we react. Um, and so that's why the church has always put uh, a great emphasis on the formation of conscience. Um, uh, reason plus God's revelation equals a well-informed conscience. And it's important to understand that not all moral actions are self-evident. That is so important to understand because uh, a lot of times we'll hear people kind of just say, well, you know, I think that, you know, you know, well, have you ever looked into it? Not really. You know, the people make, many times people make very, uh, 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 very severe decisions based on absolutely no information. And so it's important for us to, uh, especially when we're making very serious choices, to make very well-informed decisions. Um, uh, we do that with reason. We do that with God's revelation. Um, Could you give an example of a moral action that's, that's, that's not self-evident? Yeah, something like that, because it's not making any sense to me. Um, so uh, let's see, a moral action that's not self-evident. Um, I mean, that, that uh, the, uh, um, somebody, somebody says, you know, shoot, shoot this person and you'll save all these people, you know? People will start saying, well, the, you know, the consequences are the salvation of like a hundred people, a thousand people. That's a good consequence, right? Right, but the, I mean, the, the life of one, well, you know, and then so they start justifying it that way. And so... It's important to have that principle that the means must always be good, you know, or you know, or uh, you know, um, many times uh, medical medical decisions. What's right, you know, you know, what is that procedure, uh, you know, like the church has come out. Uh, one of them, I don't know if this is way over everybody's head, um, but like ectopic pregnancies, so. When um, the, instead of the uh, the embryo attaching in the uh, uterus, it attaches to the fallopian tubes. If it stays there and grows, it will burst the fallopian tube and will could cause the death of the mother. However, we cannot cause the direct. We cannot kill the child. So what do you do? Yeah, not self-evident. We don't have time to go in. What do you? That makes sense. Now I see what you're saying. So there's there's a lot of things like that. Okay. Um, we don't. Yeah. Wow. That's so there's yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of things. Um, again, when you have those serious decisions, you make them well informed. 
And surprisingly, the church has written a lot about very specific things, um, very specific uh, uh, instances. So, with our conscience, we can make a judgment in accord with our reason and divine law, or we can make an erroneous judgment, a judgment that is an error. Remember, we are not talking about culpability here. We are simply talking about whether this action is right or wrong. The formation of our conscience, we are required to never remain in ignorance. And so there's a difference between willful ignorance versus actual ignorance. So when my six years when my six year old, you know, accidentally uh, you know puts the car in drive and drives through my garage, he'll say, I didn't know it. That is, you know, actual ignorance, you know. Uh, uh, when, you're, when your 24 year old does that and he's been driving for eight years, that's, you know, you know, I don't know, I was just pulling on stuff. You know, that's, you know, a little willful ignorance. At that age, he should know better not to just, you know, push buttons and stuff. You know, so, so w the church does make that distinction that, you know, uh, uh, and especially when the church has, has made statements, you know, especially when the church has things readily available like the Catechism where we talk about the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, so for somebody to say, I went to Catholic school, but I didn't know it was wrong to kill somebody. <laughs> yes, yes you did. You know, so there's kind of that willful ignorance or that just saying, well, you know, did you look into the decision you made? Not really. We just kind of went, went by the seat of our pants, you know. Again, we're, we're held to a higher calling, we're held to a higher responsibility to always act in accord with the way that God designed us. Ignorance of Christ and His gospel, bad example given by others, enslavement to one's passions, assertion of a mistaken notion of autonomy of conscience, rejection of the church's authority and her teaching, lack of conversion and charity, these can be at the source of errors of judgment and moral conduct. Um, so there's so many things that can be at the, at the, that can lie at the root of what can lead us to erroneous judgments. It's not just ignorance or it's not just this or that. Um, you know, uh, alcoholism, you know, uh, they talk about enslavement to one's past, you know, addiction, you know. At some point, the, 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 the addict really ceases to be culpable for what he's doing um, because it's sheer addiction. Um, and so uh, we understand that, that the culpability begins to go away when we understand kind of that reason. Um, so, to choose in accord with conscience, a human being must always obey the certain judgment of his conscience. And that word certain there is key because a lot of times people have used this uh, statement or even drawn in the section of the catechism where it talks about that, where it says, well, the catechism says you just follow, your, everybody can just follow their conscience. No, no, no. The catechism says two things. Uh, uh, that your conscience must be well formed in accord with God's law and church teaching. And also that your conscience, you should always obey your conscience when it is certain. How many of us make decisions every day where we're 100% certain? Sure, here and there. But a lot of times we're like, you know, I hope this turns out well, you know. My kids, I do that all the time with my kids. I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but <laughs> Lord have mercy on me, you know. Uh, and go to confession, yeah. Um, you know, so you know, that, that idea of, of certainty uh, must always be there when we act. Uh, 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 and so, when we act with that certainty, uh, it is that obedience of conscience. Um, but again, formation is of the utmost importance. The more we form ourselves, uh, the, more, uh, the more it is that we can make that correct judgment. I mean, think about it on a very natural level. Why do we have judges? Because they are so well formed in the law that we can simply present a case to them and they can say, well, that's right, that's wrong. The end. Why? Because they are very well formed in civil law. 
Um, and it's the same with us. That formation is of utmost importance. When we form ourselves, that ability to choose the good becomes habit. When you attach grace to that habit, it, be it becomes a very powerful witness. So you have people, you know, like uh, you know, Mother Teresa, all these, all these people, uh, John Paul II, who do very heroic things, but to them it's very natural, you know. That's the most frustrating thing about being a sinner, I think, is when you see saints and they make it look so easy. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, it's important for us to continue to form ourselves, continue to learn, but always do it coupled with prayer, always do it coupled with the sacraments and grace. All right, so rules in every case. One may never do evil so that good may result of it. Like we had talked about, you cannot choose an evil means so that a, a good may come of it. Um, the golden rule, whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. Um, and uh, the Catechism states that charity must always proceed, always proceeds by way of respect for one's neighbor and his conscience. Thus, sinning against your brethren and wounding their conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, it is right not to do anything that makes your brother stumble. And so even in the case of, uh, there was a document written about priestly formation. And it was, there's a section in there where it talks about uh, uh, scandal. That, uh, uh, that priests and religious, they need to really be careful of scandal. So you have, you know, for example, you know, is it okay for a priest to drive a, a really nice car? Sure. Maybe it's, you know, his parents died and left him, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, an, an Audi A8 or something like that. You know? maybe, a, maybe not a Lamborghini quite so much. <laughs> but, but, you know, just a really nice car. You know, and what if he then gets transferred to, you know, uh, the poorest parish, you know, of Calcutta, and he brings his Audi A8 with him? Is it wrong for the priest to have it? No. But charity always proceeds by way of respect for one's neighbor and his conscience. And so, it, it, like it says, it's not right. It is right not to do anything that makes your brethren stumble. Would it be a horrible witness to have this priest be in charge of this really poor parish and drive, you know, and drive an eighty thousand dollar car? Yes. And so, not because it's sinful that the priest should give this up, but that it would cause his brothers to stumble, that it would be uh, a, a bit scandalous to the community at large, that here this priest is, you know. And so the Catechism says, never do evil so that good may come of it, the golden rule, and of course, above everything, charity. Um, so like we said, a lot of times when people think of morality, they think of the negative. But something can only be negative in relation to what? Something positive. And so uh, in this case, the positive is always the primary reality. So uh, thou shalt not kill is only a law insofar as life is extraordinarily good. So, because uh, if life was not good, then we really wouldn't have any need for you know, um, you know, an example. You know, the the life of a blade of grass is held in such low low regard these days. Um, so we, you know, so you know, we don't really have a you know because it's not really good. We don't really have a law that protects the life of a blade of grass. When I put it that way, it sounds a lot more dangerous, but. Uh, but it's really not. It's okay. You know, um, so whenever we talk about the negative, we, all, we have to remember that, uh, we, that, the, that the negative is not the primary reality. That the primary reality, the beautiful reality, is the positive. That life is so precious that we have these things. That uh, 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 sin um, is bad, but the virtues are so good. Um, the life that we can lead when we're not sinning, when we're not attached to sin, uh, is so much higher and so much more beautiful, made especially uh, evident in the lives of the saints for us. Um, and so we talk about the virtues a lot. 
Uh, the virtue is simply uh, a virtue is a an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. Um, uh, there are human virtues, so virtues that are very natural that kind of everybody understands, and then there also there's also moral virtues. So, uh, natural virtues are what we call the the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And so we understand these on a very natural level. We need wise judgment. We need a uh, 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 proper due to God, to, to other people, to our neighbor. Um, fortitude, we understand firmness and difficulty, pursuit of good. Um, and of course, temperance, that there needs to be moderation and balance. How do we acquire these virtues? We can acquire these virtues in very natural ways. Education, deliberate action, uh, perseverance. So, you know, you want to learn how to play soccer, what do you do? You just go play soccer. You practice. You do those things. So, in the same way, uh, for us as Catholics, we have to remember that if we want to be more charitable, we don't just pray to God for charity. What? We go do charitable things. Yeah. That there's this, there's this uh, uh, beauty and, and, and uh, deliberate actions based on those virtues. So, uh, you know, all of us have, have those, those virtues that are, that are hard for us. You know, patience. You know, uh, I need patience and I need it right now. You know, we, there's, uh, uh, there's those things we struggle with, those things that we have to, like, you know, use 100% of our brain to actively do, to do those with great uh, uh, deliberate action. But again, when we do those things, when we persevere through those hard times of doing those things, they become easier, they become habitual. And like, like anybody that's good at sports, you know, a golf swing, something like that. So much of it is what? Muscle memory. Same with us. Uh, uh, you know, so much of those, those good things that we can do, they can become kind of that, that spiritual memory. Like, you know, why else would I not choose the right thing to do in this situation? Uh, that it becomes a habit. Then there's also theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. So, belief in God and what He has revealed. Faith, hope, which is trust in God's mercy, forgiveness, and His promises. And love, willing the good of the other, even above, our, even above ourself. And like Scripture says, the greatest of these is love, because in, in heaven, love will be the only virtue remaining. Our hope will be fulfilled, and we will see God face to face. We will not have that veil of faith separating us from God that it will be removed and we will be with Him in, in perfect reality. And so that's one reason why the church uh, focuses so much on love, uh, um, is because it is that everlasting virtue. Hey Jason? Yeah. So did we make a distinction between human virtues and moral virtues? Was there, that, that there was a distinction made between the two? Uh, no, I was saying I was I did not I did not go into. Uh, uh, um, Is there a distinction? Um, yes, because uh, there's because there's moral virtues that come from that stem from um, uh, um, modesty, for example, is a moral virtue. It stems from a, the natural virtue of temperance, and so. Um, but I would not call, I would not necessarily, I don't know if I'd call modesty a natural virtue. Um, not just modesty of self, but of speech, of, of everything like that. That there's, you know, many different kinds of modesty. And there's moderation and balance in a lot of things. Um, I don't think I would classify that as, as a strict kind of natural virtue. But it stems from these cardinal virtues. And that's why the church holds the cardinal virtues up so high, because... If we don't have temperance, we're not going to have modesty. If we don't have, you know, uh, uh, all of these others, the, uh, uh, the subsequent virtues will be lost in and of themselves. So the, car the cardinal virtues are, are called cardinal because from them, or they, all other virtues can be classified as a sub subset of one of these virtues. Yeah. That's why, it seems like that's why they're called cardinal. Right. I guess what I'm trying to get at is when, when you list 
human virtue and moral virtue. Yeah, you would. Are we trying? To, are we trying to say that there's two classes of virtue, and then the development with cardinal virtue and theological virtue? Are we trying? Are we then saying here's other here's two other classes of virtue? I'm just trying to see how we are. How do you want to organize these? Okay. Yes. Yeah, cardinal virtues. They're natural virtues that kind of everybody is, is inclined to. Um, the Catechism says that the, the word cardo in Latin means to pivot. Um, and so uh, these are stable dispositions of the intellect and will that govern our actions. Um, and it's a, and it, it describes them as, so if you think of them that way, four pivotal human virtues. So from these four virtues come other virtues come the moral virtues the theological virtues will be in a different class because those are supernatural gifts those are gifts from God so faith hope and love sin um, that most important thing to talk about why because uh, uh, the good news is not good if there's no bad, you know. Um, and so we have to talk about this. It is a, a, a very reality that we deal with every day. And so sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. conscience. It is an offense against God, and like we said, it is saying no to God. So we have that ability to say yes, we have that ability to say no, and so we can choose that. Uh, we can choose to say no to God. Sin not only wounds the person, but also the body of Christ. And sin is always a selfish decision. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger makes the distinction that the, uh, the persons of the Trinity, they are uh, united in their relationship with each other. And in, this, in a similar way, we participate in the Trinity. Uh, we participate in that relationship with God that Christ has brought back together. Um, and what he says, when we talk about sin, sin is saying, it, it, it is, is, a, is a mild breaking of that relationship, of saying, I prefer myself than myself in relation to you. That it, it removes that relational aspect of ourselves with God. That I prefer myself as opposed to myself in relationship with you. And so uh, Ratzinger makes that very you know, small distinction, but I think it's very beautiful in, in showing uh, how it is we, 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 we live in the grace of the Holy Trinity, how it is we participate in that way. And so that sin uh, is always a selfish decision. But like we also know, all sin is fun at first, you know, that we have that inclination uh, to do it. When we talk about the gravity of sin, there's always two distinctions, mortal and venial. As Catholics, we know this very well. It's the one thing probably most of us remember uh, if we were uh, uh, raised Catholic. Um, these two distinctions, mortal and venial sin. So, mortal sin is serious sin that completely breaks our relationship with God and the mystical body of Christ, the Church. That's what the inbox stands for. Um, it completely breaks that relationship with God. Venial sin, on the other hand, is a non-serious sin that wounds our relationship with God and the church. And we all understand kind of those distinctions on a very natural level, and so we'll get into those a little more. For sin to be mortal, it must be serious or grave matter. It must be done with full consent, so there's, there's absolutely no coercion. And it must be done with full knowledge. We have to know that it is a sin. Here's an important distinction. We do not have to know all of the consequences. But when we talk about full knowledge, we must know that it's a sin. Because, you know, all of us, we will never know the full extent of our actions. We'll never know the full consequences of one thing we do, whether it be good or bad. And so, when the church talks about doing something with full knowledge, we're not talking about, if I do this, I will get 10 years in prison. 
If I do this, I will get charged with a misdemeanor. That's not the distinction we're making. We're simply saying it is a serious thing. Nobody's forcing me to do it, and I know it's wrong, and I'm choosing to do it anyway. If that thing that you're choosing is meets those uh, standards, it is a mortal sin. It breaks that relationship with God. Again, like the, the kind of the image that Ratzinger gives us, uh, uh, sin is choosing yourself as opposed to yourself in relationship with God. When, when you say full consent, no coercion, when do, what do you... I can't uh, hold a gun to John's head and say, you know, uh, go rob that bank. He, it's, not a, it's, it, it's not a mortal sin because I'm forcing him to do it. Okay. I'm coercing him to do it, yeah. Sin is a personal act. Uh, and, and again, we just went through those things that uh, uh, full knowledge, full consent, those things. They knowingly cooperate with sin. And so there's different types of cooperation that, we'll, that, that the church warns against, that we have to watch out uh, and not just say, well, I'm not the one that committed it, but I gave him the gun, the car, and filled it up full of gas. You know, that's a, that's a type of cooperation. And so we have to avoid cooperating uh, in a lot of things. So participating direct, directly or volu voluntarily in, in the sin, ordering, advising, praising, and approving, not disclosing or not hindering them, and protecting those who do them. All of those are different types of cooperation. And sadly, the root of all sin lies within our own heart. It, 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 sin is one of those uh, slippery slopes. It creates a proclivity to sin uh, and to continue. Uh, we understand this very much with lying. As children, we always told that first little lie. And then to protect that lie, we had to tell another lie. And then to protect that lie, we had to you know, tell three more. That sin creates that proclivity to sin. And so it's something that uh, we must uh, stop at the root. We must go to man's heart. Uh, and remember, like the church says, that if we want to fully understand who we are, we look to the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ fully reveals man to himself. Like we had talked about concupiscence, it's that inclination towards sin, that uh, no matter how great well, maybe the saints did all right, but I don't know, for me at least. If there's a hundred dollar, if I see somebody drop a hundred dollar bill on the ground and they don't see it, my first inclination is he didn't see that. You know, <laughs> it's horrible, absolutely horrible. Am I am I guilty for that? No, because it was that was a, a a complete reaction. Now, if I sit there and say he really didn't see that, I can totally get away with this, and I start entertaining that the idea, nobody saw him drop that. My foot is now on this hundred dollar bill that nobody saw him drop. I can, you know, that's, you know, now you're getting, now you're getting into that sinfulness. Um, but when, when, when something like that happens and we have that initial reaction or especially in that moment of anger when somebody does something unjust to us, how many times do we, or how many times do we say, well, I should just let it go. That would be no. I have never had that reaction when somebody wrongs me. Um, maybe they, maybe I'm just you know telling you my, my own weaknesses. But uh, uh, many times when when we're treated unjustly, our first reaction is, how do I make it just? I need to make it right, and I'm going to make it right by doing this. Not always the most Christian thing that we're usually probably thinking about doing. You know, cut off in traffic. We don't say, well, I forgive you. No, you don't say, nobody says that. Uh, I used to have to drive in Washington, D.C. traffic. And uh, it's an occasion of sin just to drive to work. Luckily, there were, <laughs> luckily I worked with priests, so I could immediately go to confession. But, but, it, but it's one of those things where, you know, we, we have that inclination. We all understand this. And so it's important for us to go to the root. And, and so we go to the heart of ourselves. We, we, we nourish ourselves with God's grace through the sacraments, through prayer, through all of these things, so that when those moments come up, we can simply say, it's simply a reaction, it's not that big of a deal, let it go, you know, uh, and let God's grace kind of take over. 
social justice. This is one thing that has a very uh, that the church is very uh, 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 profound on in this area of social justice. The church is the most is the number one most giving entity in the entire world. Um, and so uh, uh, the church understands that the, that the foundation and source of all morality is the dignity of the human person. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And so uh, uh, on a moral standpoint, we say it is good and it, we, are, oh, we are obliged to help others have, the, have and experience that basic right uh, themselves. And so the church works towards uh, uh, these issues begins with life and death issues. Life is sacred from conception until death. Um, the church has always had a what they call a preferential option for the poor. And so we have entire orders of, of, of sisters, of brothers, of religious orders dedicated to serving the poor. Created in the image of, of the one God and equally endowed with irrational souls, all men have the same nature and the same origin. Redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ, all are called to participate in the same divine beatitude. All therefore enjoy, enjoy equal dignity. And I love the way that, that, this, that this whole paragraph is structured. That it says, all are endowed with this rational soul. They have the same calling, the same nature. And then that's one sentence, and it doesn't, it doesn't go on to say, and all will be in heaven whether they like it or not. No, it says what? Redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ, all are called, again, respecting our free will, that God always gives us that ability to say yes and to say no. He gives us the tools, and then he gives us the choice. He doesn't say, you know, it doesn't say that he endows us with a rational soul and forces us into heaven. You know, and you know, we we have a choice in that. Why? Because you cannot have love if you do not have choice. So the equal rights of the person flow from their equal dignity. So we are all, like it said, endowed with that dignity, and therefore we all have those equal rights. How those equal rights are defined, well, our courts are trying to change a lot of those. But um, So for the Catholic, what, is this, what does this mean? Personal responsibility, public responsibility, and that we work for a just society that exercises charity and providing for its weakest members. Owning property or having wealth creates additional obligations to others and added duties. A, a similar way is if somebody has a particular gift, they also have a particular responsibility. And, and it says, in, in employing people, the church always insisted on a just and living wage. Recent teaching has focused on the international society and it always begins with the social and work habits of the individual. One of the most beautiful documents that the church has um, is, is, the, uh, um, is uh, one by Pope Leo XIII on uh, the dignity of, of work. And so he talks uh, in a very beautiful way how uh, part of man's dignity comes in what, he, in what he's able to do uh, in his work, that there is a dignity to work. And so, for example, things like uh, uh, communism uh, uh, and other isms, they, 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 they take away from the dignity of the human person by taking away their right to, to own property, their right to choose how they want to work, um, and things like that. And so, uh, uh, this teaching, whether we're talking about an international society or any of these things, uh, it begins uh, with the rights of the individual. Um, the church also talks about a thing called social sin. Um, the, the effect of sin over time which can affect the whole of a society or a community. Examples would be violence, prejudice, drug dealing, things like that. And so there's these, these <coughs> social issues where we can't simply say, you know, this, this thing or 
this person allowed this thing to happen, this person committed this thing, but uh, things that are present in a society that we either allow or the things that we promote. And so it's important uh, uh, for us to also work on the, the social issue when it comes to w w when it comes to sin at least. So natural moral law uh, is, it's written on our hearts and it is the most basic moral duties that we understand. There's a uh, there's a good book out there by a, a, a professor of law at uh, the University of Texas at Austin of all places. Um, and it's called What We Can't Not Know. Um, and it's a whole, it's a, it's a beautiful book on uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the undeniability of, of natural moral law, that it is all, that it is there for every person. And he goes to show how it becomes most evident in civil law and, and things. But it, it's, a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great job, and it, again, it's written by you know, a professor of, I think, I think uh, civil law, um, at uh, uh, UT Austin. So, how do we sum up this natural moral law, most especially uh, with the Ten Commandments? If we want to sum it up even quicker, we could say, do good, avoid evil. <clears throat> it's important to note that Christ came to fulfill the law, and the new law is love, grace, and freedom. He did not abolish the old law, but He simply fulfilled it. I say simply, but he fulfilled it. It's a law of love, it's a law of grace, it's a law of true freedom. And so, you know, for, for example, many times in the scriptures it talks about, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you know, who were following uh, 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 the letter of the law, but, you know, ignoring the spirit. So what do we mean by that law? You know, I think that's a good thing to kind of highlight for a second. That idea of uh, um, following the word, but ignoring the, the, the spirit of the law. So you have the, uh, uh, the the law, thou shalt not kill. How many of you are doing that right now? Oh, good night. Okay, all of you are doing that right now. You are not killing. You are you are following the letter of the law. Therefore, are you are therefore you're righteous. You are in the highest eyes of, of God because you are fulfilling that commandment, thou shalt not kill. But what is the spirit of the, of the law. Why is that law there? Yeah. And so, do we act in a way that treats every human life as precious? You know? And so, and so we get into kind of that law and the law and the, the spirit. So you had, you know, many times in, in Jesus' own day, you had, you know, or even now we have the saying, don't be Pharisaic. You know, where we're with well, the letter of the law, blah, 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 blah. Is the letter important? Absolutely. Can you have the spirit without the letter? No. And so it's important for us to have that letter of the law, but uh, 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 to not stop there, to not say, I'm doing good, I'm not killing people. It's, no, but are you loving people? You know, and so when we look at like the old, so when we look at like the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes, you know, or even the, just take the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, uh, Jesus says, you know, not only have you heard that it would, that you shouldn't uh, uh, kill your neighbor, but what? You shouldn't even be angry with him. You know, not only should you not commit adultery, but what? You shouldn't even lust after another woman, for if you've committed adultery of the heart. You know, Christ was calling them to something higher. Christ was calling them to, yes, obey the letter of the law. Obeying the letter of the law is a start. Why? Because if we have those inclinations to do those things, the law is there to help us act in a way appropriate. Christ comes and with His grace, we're able to go beyond the law. To live out the Spirit in complete love so that... Uh, 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 for for example, the, the that that uh, um, when when Christ says that you know um, uh, do not even look lustfully at another woman, you know um, that the human person can go from not just you know oh I'm doing good I'm not committing adultery to not even looking at another woman lustfully to looking at at every human person the way that God sees them. 
made in the image and likeness of God. I used to, when I did youth ministry, I used to tell the teens, I was like, when you're walking through the hallway of your school, look at every person and say, made in the image and likeness of God. Image and likeness of God. And they, they came back and they said, I looked at people I hated, and I'd say, image and likeness of God, and they were like, I still hated them, but I looked at them a little differently, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, you're, you're starting, you're, you're getting there, you're getting there. You know, it's, and it's one of those things where, you know, it's one thing to not do something, but it's another thing to do something the way that God wants us to. So, yeah, it's good that we're not committing adultery, but are we looking at the human person the way uh, that God wants us to? And so, as a culture, we are, we are very much a, a pornographic culture. We do not respect the human person uh, the way uh, that God designed it. And so that's one of those things that we as a culture need to fix. One of those social sins that we need to fix. And so we go beyond not just doing, but actively doing something the way that God designed it. And so it's important for us to have kind of that, that understanding of, of not just saying, well, I'm following the letter of the law. You know, um, another example, you know, just going to Mass. Well, I'm going to Mass every Sunday. Yeah, but are you praying? <laughs> you know, are you praying at Mass? You know, so it's one of those things where uh, uh, the, the law is there to protect us, the law is there to help us, but the law is not the fulfillment uh, uh, of the way we, we were built. The law is simply not doing something. Um, justification. The gracious action of God which frees us from sin sanctifies and renews the interior. Free us, free, free us from sin and then by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit perfects our nature. And so God's grace is there to not only help us extinguish our vices, but to fill us with, our vir to fill us with those virtues. That uh, St. Thomas always said, grace perfects nature. So we build up those natural virtues, then infused with God's grace, those natural virtues give birth uh, to new life. Um, Justification is an action of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit merited by Christ on the cross, and in accord with the will of the Father. And in this way, it is trinitarian. And in this way, uh, justification uh, uh, is not through our works. Justification is through uh, our saying yes. We do have a cooperation to play. We uh, we are not forced to be justified by God. We do have some say in it. Grace, how are we justified? We are justified by grace. And this grace uh, is a participation in the life of God. Both intimacy with the, with the Trinity, which is supernatural, but it is also a free and undeserved gift. That it's one thing to forgive us of our sins. It's another thing to give us grace. And so, this grace is a free gift from God. Therefore, heaven is a free gift from God. Types of grace, there are kind of a, a two main types, sanctifying grace and actual grace. Uh, sanctifying grace is that grace that brings us into that inner life. Into that inner life of the Trinity. We think of it as birth. It brings us into that life. Mortal sin is a loss of this specific grace. Actual grace is the grace of movement towards God. And so this we feel all the time when we are moved towards God, whether that be doing something good to our neighbor, whether that be uh, uh, calling us to something in prayer, giving us aid in prayer, giving us aid in times of need. And there's also other kinds, sacramental graces, uh, uh, special graces, things like that. And they are all at the service of charity, which builds up the church. So like the sacraments, um, like Allison, she went through like the effects of uh, uh, the sacraments. All of those are sacramental graces. So the Eucharist, it uh, uh, commits you to the poor, frees you from venial sin, or forgives venial sin, um, unites you to Christ, unites, unites you more intimately with the church. All of these are sacramental graces. 
The Catechism states, With regard to God, there is no strict right to any merit on the part of man. Between God and us there is an immeasurable inequality. For we have received everything from Him, our Creator. And so there, there stands this infinite gap between us and God. Nothing we do can get us there. However, God in His love said, I will become one of you. And being God, Jesus had the ability to bridge that gap. And so uh, uh, that's the main reason why you know, Jesus is both God and man. He's God because He had the ability to reconcile us with the Father. But He's man because we were the ones that sinned. He had to come on behalf of us. You know, the kid that throws the rock through the window. He's the one that has to say sorry. Doesn't matter who has the, you know, who pays for it. He's the one that has to, to, to present himself and say he is sorry. In the same way, Jesus became one of us so that he could go to the Father and say, I am truly sorry. On behalf of man, I will take on the sin. I will take on the debt. I will pay the price. And because he's also God, he had the power to bridge that eternal gap. United to Him, we can now enter into heaven. And that's why when the church talks about baptism, that it is a reality. That unity with God, unity with Jesus Christ, is a reality that happens. Uh, the incarnational principle. So, because Christ has become human, humanity is now raised. So, what Christ is by nature, we can become by grace. And so, what I mean by that is um, this next part on our merit. Because of this, God can apply His grace to our actions when done in selfless love. Uh, a key principle, suffering has great meaning and redemptive value. So the things that we suffer, we can offer up to God. Why? Because Jesus became one of us. He suffered, He died, and He rose. As brothers and sisters of Christ, we can enter into that mystery. A good example is, I, I had a friend of mine who uh, I hadn't really talked to for about 10 years. And he always emailed me on my birthday, just happy birthday. He was the only one that never, he never Facebooked me on my birthday. So I always respected him a little more. Because <laughs> Facebook tells you when it's, you know, when it's my birthday. Um, but he always sent me an email and stuff. And so this last email he sent me was, you know, happy birthday. Just want to let you know I'm Catholic again. I couldn't be happier. Uh, and I just want to, you know, and I was like, oh my God. You know, like it was a complete shock uh, that he came back to the church. Um, and uh, uh, I got to talking to him some more. He came up and visited and things. And he said, he was like, you know, you, you know, and a couple of times he said this, you know, you said something to me once, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, sure. I have no, I have no recollection of that. I have no uh, 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 understanding of, of the context of even. I, I don't remember anything about anything that I said. Therefore, the effect that it had on him. Do I have anything to do with that? No. Why? Because those words that I said a long time ago are affecting him right now. Am I still saying those words? Am I still implying those words? Am I reminding him of those words? No. I've been out of the picture for 10 years. But, God is able to take things that we do, take things that we say, and He's able to apply His grace to them so that they can uh, 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 have meaning, so that they can become graced moments in somebody else's life. And so when, when something like that happens, we can just all we can say is, Thank you, God. You know, and so it's important for us to, to have that understanding of, uh, of merit. That our merit, the part that we do, it, it can never get us to heaven. It can never bridge that eternal gap. But that merit, those works, when we're living in the grace of God, when we're asking God to, to, to help us in everything we do, that God's able to take those things that we say, and He's able to apply His grace to those things beyond our control, beyond anything, uh, 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 any recognition or anything that we could receive from that. And that's, and that's the beauty and the power of God, is that He's able to take 
you know, words that, they were so insignificant that I don't even remember them. You know, uh, he's able to take, all of us, I'm sure, have those stories where we've done, you know, somebody says, oh yeah, you know, I remember you know, when you did that. Sometimes not the good ones, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing that God can do. It's the power of God that He can take something so small and turn it into something for somebody else to be so big. <coughs> and so the church, uh, the church is both mother and teacher. And it is only in the church where we can live out this vocation. The sacraments can only come to us through the church. Christ left only a church. He did not leave us a Bible and a catechism. I wish he would have. But he <laughs> would have saved so much arguing and so many, you know. Uh, but he didn't. He left a church. Um, in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of truth. And so, like we saw in the conversion story of Saul, Christ intimately unites himself to the church, to where it's the point where Christ self-identifies uh, uh, himself as the church. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting those Christians? He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he doesn't just say, you know, keep warm and well fed, good luck and God bless, or me bless. He's, he says, uh, at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. He says, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. He gives us a promise of His uh, eternal presence. He gives the church those disciples that command. Go, baptize, teach, but don't just, you know, do it on your own goodwill. He says, don't worry. I'll be with you always until the end of the age. And so, when we look for, for God in the church, we don't look to necessarily the people. We look to the sacraments. We look to the church's teaching. We look to uh, 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 the, the church in the way that she uh, uh, structures her life, the way that she structures the faith. The Catechism says, To the Church belongs the right always and everywhere to announce moral principles, including those pertaining to the social order, and to make judgments on any human affairs to the extent that they are required by the fundamental rights of, hu of the human person or the salvation of souls. And so the Church makes these pronouncements on, uh, on, on standards of morality. And so the Church has written a lot. You know, just recently, Pope Francis came out and made a statement saying, you know, talking about the, the, the fighting, he just said, stop. You know, the church has that duty, the church has that responsibility to be a voice uh, uh, of morality uh, in, the, in the church. Infallibility. So, the Catechism says, the, su the supreme degree of participation in the authority of Christ is ensured by the charism of infallibility. This infallibility extends as far as does the deposit of divine revelation. It also extends to all those elements of doctrine, including morals, without which the saving truths of faith cannot be preserved, explained, or observed. And so, uh, when the church pronounces something in, in, in the case of infallibility, it is always on faith and morals. It is always on one of those things. The, the, the church doesn't come out and say, the Red Sox will win you know, this year, you know, or you know, the Cowboys you know, will get a new owner. The, the church, you know, never, church never uh, uh, comes out and says you know, silly things like that. Um, but the church comes and makes statements on faith and morals. And so a lot of times, you know, you, you may ask, well, what about all those, all those bad popes? You know, what about all those, those just super unholy men? What did they do to faith and morals of the church? Yes, they were horrible witnesses. Yes, they probably turned a lot of people away from the Catholic faith by their witness. But what did, what did they do to uh, uh, the faith uh, uh, the, the, the doctrines of the faith, what do they do to the moral principles of the, of the church? Nothing. And that we can only attribute to the Holy Spirit. Because honestly, 
these guys had a lot of power. But sometimes the Holy Spirit acts, sometimes the Holy Spirit preserves. Um, and, and so when we uh, talk about this infallibility, how it's played out throughout history, again, a lot of it, uh, 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 and how you know the, the Holy Spirit works in the church, a lot of that is kind of a mystery. Uh, we can we can talk to God about that in eternity. Faith and morals, um, and so there's always a connection between the truths of the faith and the morals. We live our faith, and we say that all the time. But we need to really think about that. That when we talk about morality, it's not just these 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 uh, commandments. It's not just these things like that. But they have to do with what we profess in the creed. They have to do with what. Uh, uh, we say. And the aspects of our faith, we not only believe in the person, but we believe in what they are saying. So for example, uh, my, my son, uh, when we used to live in our townhouse, he would, he, his favorite game was to stand on stairs and jump. And he'd take a step higher and try it then. And so, I mean, he was up like four or five stairs, and he's looking at me, a little worried, and I, I said, don't worry, I got gotcha. you. And he just kind of stood there and looked at me. Uh, that's a great example of faith. Not only did he have to have faith in me, but he had to have faith in what I said. Like if I told him, dude, I'm not going to catch you. I cannot catch you. You know, he would have had to have faith. But he, but he had faith in both who I am as a father, but also in what I said. I told him I could catch him. So he had a faith in someone, but also in something. And so our faith is the same way. Not only do we have faith in someone, Jesus Christ, but we have faith in what He said and what He did. I think they should rename this instead of precepts of the church, how to be a nominal Catholic. Um, because that's here's how to be a minimum cat. Because that's essentially that's essentially what that what they mean. Um, attend mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation. Conf confess sins at least once a year. Receive the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. Observe the days of fast and abstinence. Provide the needs of the church. Do we need this? Yes. Why? Because for many people. Uh, uh, and I used to be one of those because I went to college. Um, I needed that. Why? To hold me to some standard. Because for me in college, that was hard. <laughs> you know, for, for, for a lot of people, that could be hard. And so while, while, while I do make a joke about it, it is very important that we have that standard. It's very important that we have that um, because uh, 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 it sets uh, kind of that, uh, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like your, your mother reminding you of things, you know. Um, for a lot of us, you know, growing up, I needed my mom to constantly remind me to do things, you know. Um, and so, you know, slow down, that was the first thing that she always... Because <laughs> my first car was a Mustang with a V8, yeah. Um, got in a lot of trouble with that. Um, so she always told you know I needed my mom to sit there and tell me slow down, slow down, slow down, you know, uh, and it probably saved my life on a couple of occasions. Um, but we we need we need that standard to then build on. But we should not again we should not just say, well I do that, you know, well I'm not murdering. That should not be our maxim. That should not be what we strive to live. We should strive to live beyond this. And so, now we're just going to look at a couple of commandments. I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously because of time, but also because uh, y'all can read the catechism sections on there. Um, and many of them, again, because they are based on natural law, many of them are obviously self-evident. Um, the second commandment, the name of the Lord is holy. Uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, and so, like scripture, for example... You'll see, even in Scripture, you'll see Lord written like this, and sometimes you'll see Lord written uh, with all caps. And that's because uh, in the Hebrew uh, translation, Lord with all caps is where uh, it referred to Yahweh. Lord, spelled like that, referred to uh, the word Adonai. 
And so, uh, even in Scripture, the Lord's name is held. Even uh, uh, Jewish people, they do not pronounce uh, Yahweh. Or even some, uh, there's, there's a... There's a Jewish uh, artist, his name is, or musician, his name is uh, Modest Yahoo. He thanks God in like his little CD cover and stuff, but he writes G dash D. He won't even write G O D. He will not even write out of respect. And so uh, the second commandment, it's important for us to to hold it in high regard um, and to hold it uh, and and only uh, use it in time in, in the time that we are going to praise God. Second commandment for, forbids the abuse, uh, forbids blasphemy, uh, which includes doing evil things in the name of God. The Catechism says he must keep, keep it in mind in silent, loving adoration. He will not introduce it into his own speech except to bless, praise, and glorify that. And I, and I love that expression. Keep it in the mind in silent, loving adoration. The third commandment, Sabbath, it is the crown of creation. It is always a holy day of obligation. And it is a great sin to miss Mass for no good reasons. And it is essentially, it is the heart of all authentic Catholic spirituality. And I say no good reason. Because there are reasons to miss Mass. My wife had a baby on Sunday morning. That's a great reason to miss Mass. Um, but... Well, I, you know, I slept in and missed the usual Mass I go to, so I'm not even going to try to go to one of the other eight that are being offered that day. Not a good reason. Again, there has to be some legitimacy to that. Again, not there to hold us to, to, to be scrupulous, uh, uh, um, but to hold us you know, uh, 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 to, to, that, to that minimum to keep us safe. You know, like my mom, slow down, you know. Um, it's it's a similar thing to to keep us um, in that in that uh, grace of God. Fifth commandment: Life is. Uh, respect your parents. And really, yeah, you guys got that. Life is sacred. Period. Homicide, abortion, euthanasia, suicide—all of these are are obviously. Uh, offenses against the fifth commandment, legitimate defense. If somebody is attacking you, you have a right to defend yourself. Um, if somebody's, you know, and also your family. Uh, scandal. We already talked a little bit about that in war, uh, unjust war. Um, that is something else that is a grave offense against uh, uh, the fifth commandment. And so all of these, the catechism kind of lays out very nicely. Uh, they do make a very nice, uh, they have a statement on nuclear weapons that the arms race is one of the greatest curses on the human race and the, and the harm it inflicts on the poor is more than can be endured. And there, it says that there is never a legitimate use for nuclear weapons. Because nuclear weapons have as their end complete decimation of an entire area, a very large area, and to inflict as many casualties as possible. Sixth commandment, um, human sexuality is a gift from God, and this is correctly practiced through chastity. Uh, the definition of this, of chastity, is the integration of sexuality within the human person. And it is associated with temperance, and it balances the passions with reason. And so, like you had hinted to before about the the the, uh, the natural virtues leading to other virtues, chastity being another one that comes from temperance. And so, if somebody does not have temperance, can they really practice chastity? No. And so, again, grace builds upon nature. We have to have those natural virtues so that we can practice those supernatural virtues. Marriage vows. So, uh, uh, marriage is an exchange of persons. The questions of intent in the right of marriage um, essentially ask, have you come here freely? Do you offer yourselves totally? Will you be faithful? And will you be fruitful? That's essentially the questions of intent through the marriage vows. And so those four aspects are a good way to look at marriage. Marriage is free, total, faithful, and fruitful. 
It is a covenant which involves God, not a contract. <clears throat> the marital act, therefore, reflects what is said in the marriage vows. So, the conjugal, spousal, marital, you'll see those words throughout the catechism. They all mean the same thing. The ends of the marital act are unity and procreation, or to put it in the vernacular, babies and bonding. Um, now, does that mean unreasonable? No. Again, always coupled with reason. And we can understand these ends, especially through our own natural reasoning, that the unity of the husband and the wife is both a very unifying thing, but it is also what? A very procreative thing. Um, and so those ends are natural ends. It's not something that's a far stretch of the, imagin the imagination. The conjugal act. Sex is not just an act. It is an act between the spouses. It is a living out of the marriage vows. It is free. It is total. It is faithful. And it is fruitful. Therefore, it is not coercive. It is a gift of the entire self. It holds nothing back. It is faithful, it is exclusive and monogamous, and it is fruitful, in it, which means it is open to life. And so because sex participates in the creative power of God and has the end of an eternal soul, it belongs in a lifelong committed relationship. That is the only proper relationship a lifelong committed relationship is the only proper context to bring an eternal soul into this world. A child, if in sacred scripture, is the best testimony to this next one. A child is always a gift from God. Therefore, like we said, it belongs in that lifelong committed relationship. Therefore, the church has the view that sex always belongs in marriage. And outside of marriage, it is always seriously wrong. So, things like contraception. It removes the procreative aspect. John Paul II said the unitive and the procreative aspects are intertwined and inseparable. And he even goes as far as to say that when you choose to disassociate one, you cause harm to the other. Because of time, we're not going to go through all of this. You can go through it. Um, and I, I do want to point out the Catechism, which was written in 1992 in the French, 94, the English was published, and this is what the Church said in 1994 uh, about homosexuality. The number of men and women who have, ha have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their, in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross the difficulties they encounter from their condition. The church is saying homosexual acts are always sinful. These inclinations, while being disordered, are not sinful. So the sinfulness does not lie in a person having same-sex attraction. It in, it, 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 the sin lies in them living that out in, in the action. And so a very good, uh, there, it just came up on the internet, it's called The Third Way. It's a, about a half hour, it's done really well. And it's saying that, uh, uh, it, it, it shows that uh, the Catholic way, the Catholic understanding is kind of this third way to our culture. Our culture says either anything goes, do whatever you want, do whatever feels good. And then you have the Westboro Baptist Church that says God hates you because you are this way. God punishes the world because of homosexuality. That's ridiculous and stupid. It makes Christians look horrible. Um, and so the church says no, there's a third way that we all have our cross to bear. This is a particular cross that particular people have to bear. And they should not be treated, uh, 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 um, they should not be cast aside, they should not be, uh, uh, like they said, they must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. 
every sign of unjust discrimination in their, re in their regard should be avoided. But at the same time, on the part of the church, on the part of Catholics, we can in no way uh, uh, encourage or endorse or promote the actions, the lifestyle, or equating that to marriage. Any sexual actions outside of marriage is wrong. There can never be marriage between two persons of the same sex. Therefore, any actions they do are wrong. A tricky one. So the seventh commandment dealing with stealing, theft, is defined as taking another's property against the reasonable will of the owner. That's something we always kind of uh, uh, think about. And it's, it's where we can say consent is, is presumed. So if, uh, and by this what I mean is, uh, uh, say Lister brings in a, a, a 24 pack of waters to class and then leaves the room. He sets it on the table. Is it okay for me to presume that I can have one of those waters? Yeah. He brings them, he, he presents them on the front table, or say he puts them on the chair up here. Do I have Lister's permission to take that though? No. So is it stealing? <laughs> My reasonable, you know, the, the, I would say the reasonable will of Lister is that he brought those for the class. Because I can think of no other reason why he would bring a case of waters to this class uh, and just set them on the table. So while it's not necessarily stealing, uh, 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 be careful. Again, the reasonable will. Don't let your kids know about this until they're old, much older. <laughs> and so finally to conclude, and I apologize for going a little over, um, morality is not a set of rules, but life lived in fulfillment. It is life lived according to the divine plan. Like the example we said, we operate a car according to how it was designed to operate. If we do not, we will break the car and we can hurt ourselves. And so we live our life based on how God designed us. The negative, which is what uh, morality a lot of times may focus on, or a lot of times what our attention focuses on, the negative of morality, uh, uh, it is always dependent upon the positive. And so the positive becomes the primary reality. And we have to remember that, and especially if we're teaching uh, uh, children, forming them, we focus on the positive. You know, if we, if we teach them how sacred life is, do we really need to tell them, thou shalt not kill? No. It's something that, that, that comes very naturally. And so when we teach them that positive side, that primary reality of here's how God designed us, here's how God made us, here's how God made us, and if we live this way, we will be uh, uh, just ever joyful and ever happy and we'll live a life in great fulfillment in God's grace. If we live this way, they'll understand these things. It's a lot easier for us, but a lot of times we fall into beginning with the negative. And so if we're helping to form children, it's important to highlight, uh, uh, highlight the positive, begin with the positive, but never neglect the negative. Always bring it in there. Okay? So with that, let's go ahead and end quickly. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.